Ryan, what's on your radar? So tomorrow evening at 11.59 p.m., if John Deere and its unionized workers in the Midwest haven't reached a deal on a new contract, 10,000 workers are set to walk off the job, which will be the largest strike since nearly 50,000 UAW workers went on strike in 2019. 2019, though, was a whole other world, a world without COVID and without constant complaints by bosses of a labor shortage. For John Deere, 2021 has been a stellar year. They're on pace to earn nearly $6 billion in profits, with an equipment division profit margin of 19%. And all this is happening before the trillion dollar infrastructure bill has passed the House. When that happens, and it's only a matter of time, that's billions more that'll be spent buying equipment needed to build out our infrastructure. And since UAW members have put their lives on the line through a pandemic to help John Deere get where they are, they're demanding a piece of it. Over the weekend, the union's members voted on a contract that John Deere had offered and that union, mem and that union leadership argued was a good deal. It contained an 11% pay raise over six years and maintained the current premium health insurance plan, which the company had threatened to nix. The union also won major arguments and concessions on the question of overtime. But for many workers, rejecting the contract has become a matter of solidarity with future workers. The pension system is already a two-tiered creation at John Deere, with people hired after 1997 getting a much weaker version. The company proposed making it a three-tier system, with people hired after November 1st only eligible for a 401k and other non-pension retirement plans. Now, it almost sounds quaint to be fighting over pensions after the labor movement has been so badly beaten on that issue. And when they do win, the companies end up going bankrupt and the pension gets looted by private equity giants. But at bottom, it's a question of dignity. When the contract was put to a vote, more than 90% of workers voted it down, a stunning turn of events that left union leaders shaken. That's what leaves us with the Wednesday deadline for the union and the company to strike a new deal or make enough progress to justify extending the deadline. The workers have made clear that if their bosses and their union reps don't put something better on the table, they're ready to walk. All of this is happening amid a major internal fight over what kind of union UAW ought to be. For years, it's been a top-down, boss-led union, recently mired in corruption. But a consent decree with the feds has forced it to allow a vote on union democracy. And next month, workers will have a chance to restructure the union to make it member run. All of this is happening amid a major internal fight over what kind of union UAW ought to be. For years, it's been a top-down, boss-led union, recently mired in corruption. But a consent decree with the feds has forced it to allow a vote on union democracy. And next month, workers will have a chance to restructure the union to make it member run. The members taking the lead in this Midwest fight are making the case that a member-driven union, unwilling to roll over for management, will in the end get more for workers. Now, union militancy doesn't always work out for workers, just ask the air traffic controllers. And there's never a guarantee that a strike will get workers exactly what they're fighting for. Capital, of course, is extremely powerful, and sometimes it can crush a worker stoppage. But what the workers at John Deere are telling both their bosses and their union reps is that they've had enough. In many ways, that's the same message millions of workers around the country are giving by refusing to go quickly back to work, sparking endless rounds of panic about a worker shortage. But there isn't really a worker shortage. The workers are out there. They're just not willing to take a beating like they have for so long. Now, it's not obvious how long this moment of genuine worker power will last. But John Deere's UAW workers appear ready to try to make the most of it, whether their union reps like it or not. So on Sunday, when the results started coming in of this, this contract, first batch is like, oh, wow, it's pretty strongly against this contract. By the end of the evening, 90 plus percent of workers taking this contract, and sometimes union leadership sends a contract that they think stinks so that their workers will vote it down, so that they can then come back to management right. and say, look, we told you this was garbage. You know, bring us something better that we can take to workers. That's not what happened here. The union was like, no, this, guys, this is a good deal. We, we, this, this is as good as we can get. And the workers, by night, and they, this is a 90% voter participation also. So it's not as if just a handful right. of like the, most the ang angriest people right. that are most involved showed up. Pretty much everybody voted, and pretty much everybody said, no, shove this. 
What do, you, what, do you, what do you make of that in the context of this conversation we're having about wages and worker right. shortages? I mean, it's a, it's a, I feel like it's a turning point right now for the, um, for the labor movement. Avi, you know, you've mentioned and we've talked about here some of the past problems the UAW has had, two previous right. presidents in prison for right. corruption, um, a, a lot of, I think, a, a loss of respectability, of trust, even among, not just among people who are kind of skeptical of unions, but even Actual people internally, members. right? Mem yeah. Members don't want this either. Like, what are you being given to give us this contract? Kind right. Of I mean, that's the, right, that's the right. classic, exactly, classic kind of criticism of unions that are poorly run or run by right. corrupt people who are popular pocketing the money and then the workers are no better off. So it's, you know, I'm, I'm very interested in, we've, you know, we've talked about, we had a guest on to talk about right. last week, this effort to make it more, much more um, member driven. And uh, it would, then it, that will do a lot of good and, and have probably a better relationship with management because they don't right. have to go through these very corrupt people. Yeah. And, and these things are very much linked, I think, this, yeah. this, this referendum around democracy, which will basically, if it, if it passes, it means that members get to elect their own officers in Right. Union officers, which you would think intuitively, wait a minute, they don't get to do that? Where do they come right, from? Right. What, what's, what's going on here? And so, but for years, this, that has been the way that the UAW is run, like a, a fiefdom of, of, a, of a royalty that, that has control over it. And when, when you have no checks on you, like you're going to, you're going to wind up seeing this immense amount of corruption. Uh, and, and then the workers are going to not trust contracts right. that so in some ways, like manage, management benefits, like you said, from a union that feels like it has the that that feels like it has a symbiotic relationship with its leadership, that right. its leadership represents them. Because then, if 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 the union bosses come to you, they're not bosses anymore. They right. they, they come to you. They are they're you. They're the representatives of you, and say, here, no, really, this is the best we could do. I suggest we support this. You're much more likely to say, okay, I trust you. And I do, I draw, you probably don't draw this distinction, but I do draw a distinction between private sector unions and public sector unions because- It's, it's a fair distinction uh, to draw. Right, because right. It, pri employees of private companies, they unionize, there's an incentive to eventually come to some deal that is, acceptable to everyone because they don't want to put the company out of business because then they'd be out of jobs. Right. Whereas there's slightly different incentives in the public sector because it's you can't, can't shut really down the, put the <laughs> yeah. can't put the government. It's us paying, not right. you know. Some, and you can't strike. Like, right. You're not like you're basically barred from striking if right. you're a public sector. So it's you, different for that reason. But so they can, so my, my point being, I, I think they can be an important component of 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 private sector employment, labor, et cetera. And right. uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was it was the capitalist class that that, yeah. that wanted them so that they could have peace between workers and bosses after 50 years of violence, uh, of <laughs> explicit right. violence. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's yeah. Better, better that people are happy when they go to work, turns out. Certainly. Better for the bosses. Certainly. So, anyway, looking forward to what's on your radar up next.